Today we have Xi. He's a PhD at the Australian National University and he's going to talk to you about computer performance micros microscopy with Shim. Sorry, I mispronounced that. Please welcome Xi. So, hi, hello, my name is Xi. So, this is a co work. Uh, I'm almost finished my PhD. So, uh, this is co work with my two supervisors, Steve, uh, Steve Blackburn, who is a professor at NU, and uh, Catherine, who is a researcher at Microsoft. So, and uh, the goal of this tool is just to try to push the CPU to the limit, right? So, if you look at your computers, every computer actually, your CPU running at gigahertz. But when you're profiling, you work on 100 kilohertz. So this is the talk, try to push the profiler as high as possible. If you look at any CPU, like Haswell, this is a normal desktop, it say, okay, this CPU can retain four micro-ops or four instructions per cycle, four instruction per cycle, right? When they sell, they tell you that. But if you run some, run some benchmarks, this is all the Java benchmarks, normal Java benchmarks, say, no one, almost no one go, higher than two, right? So this CPU in theory can retire four instruction per cycle. Okay. There's a plenty of room there here. So if you want to optimize your system, you may say, you may ask a question that why? Why my IPC is so low, right? <laughs> right. So if you look at one, 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 one benchmark called Lucerne, this is quite important benchmark because it's, it's, it's using the Lucerne, and Lucerne is quite a, a popular open source searching framework. Uh, this try just use Lucent to do some searching, and this one is, has pretty low IPC. And uh, uh, if you if you ask the developer, say uh, try to speed up my program by 50 percent next month, and what it's going to do is he's going to grab a profiler, try to say why it's slow, and then you grab a profiler, or maybe if you have money, you can buy some Vtune or use Perf, like power is here, like you can use the Perf. Uh, Perf says more, I'm more than counters. Right, and then what's your sampling frequency? Your sampling frequency is by default is one kilohertz, which is 1,000 points per second, and your CPU at least running on gigahertz, and the maximum, uh, maximum is 100 kilohertz, right? So, but anyway, this is the current tools you have. You plug in the tools, you figure out what's happened. So this is uh, still the same benchmark. You ask the profiler, say. Please tell me I have top 10 method. The top 10 method, I know that is pretty much contributes most of my execution time. And uh, hey, profiler, tell me what's my IPC over those 10 methods. And your IPC tell you this is uh, all your 10 methods and this is your IPC. And you say, what the hell? This means all of them are bad, right? All of them, so this same thing gives me the average information. It doesn't help him as much. So let's use the maximum, let's use the highest frequency we can get with the current uh, profiler. And this is the result, tell you. <laughs> a slightly better. But you know, your CPU running gigahertz. And you, you have your 10 method. Your boss asks you to figure out somewhere you can improve our performance. What has happened if you push your profiling frequency a little bit higher? We push this way. Right? If you push to 10 megahertz, and this is what we're going to say, and this is one method false method is going to pop up. This guy has the lowest IPC. So there's something interesting happening there. You go to look for, you figure out why for is so slow, and you can improve for. Of course, some, some methods still like, give you similar information. Right? So, and here is the for, right? For is, uh, well, for, you can, you can image what for is doing. For is doing some memory operation, right? It's blocking memory. So, and this is normally do. How can you sampling an IPC? Normally, you set up two counters, one counter count, how many cycles is gone, you another counter count, how many instructions I have done. And then you calculate the IPC, quite simple. So, and then, let's say this is time, and there's a CPU quite busy working, what do you do that at any time you prop the CPU, say, what's your counters now? What are those counters value? And you read them. After a while, you read another, you read the counters again, you calculate the IPC. So what IPC means actually the represent the average behavior for this a tiny period for this period. And you do this again and again. Right? But if you look inside the CPU, the CPU actually just fluctuation like just doing totally different behavior. So you won't able to see them. 
So IPC is a naturally high frequency signal. What do you do? You average them. After you average them, a, a, a lot of information is just gone. Right? This still, again, this is a, if I want to do a timeline veil, this is my time. And I, for example, I got the functions, this is my time. I, you ask the same question, say, tell me IPC, I want to figure out what's happening in my program. This is one kilohertz, it's horizontal line, because on average, the, the CPU behavior is very stable. And then this is 100 uh, kilohertz, and you get some trends, you know that some periods happen, and this is what happened, you push to 10 megahertz. Right, and you see some pattern, interesting patterns coming out. And you can run some statics, statistical analyze tools to figure out some. Like I, I, I'm doing a very interesting thing that after I collect the data, I build a FFT model and try to figure out the patterns where uh, the electrical engineer uses a lot. But you can see there's a patterns. And the last time there's a short, there's a short period that your RPC go very high. And if you check which method they are in or some other information, you can get a lot. So why the perf, the most popular tool, won't allow you push to 10 megahertz, right? And it's simple. So if you look the, this is current source code. Uh, if you look this one, it has a common, say, perf samples done is a very clear, pre I cannot go that high. How to, actually, I give this talk at Intel. And I pop this one, and the one guy say, uh, hey, this looks like familiar. This, this is what I wrote last month, or something <laughs> like that. And I and, and ask him, uh, so why you set your limit to 100 kilohertz? And he said, oh, you know, I was using perf uh, to do some very interesting analyze. But every time, if I push to more than 100 kilohertz, then the CPU won't respond. So I have to push the res reset button. So I decide just. Uh, is hard coded there. Say 100 kilohertz, this is what you get. Don't want to go higher. Of course, you can go higher. Every interrupt, a interrupt, take about a thousand cycles. Right? So if you don't, the, for the perf, the problem that's the perf occasionally go to slow pass. And in slow pass, you just block there. Right? So, and if you block there, at the same time, the interrupt coming, and you know what it happened. Right? So your whole system just keep the inner processing interrupt time. And all the information you collect, represent what the interrupt doing, okay? So this is a tr uh, traditional profiler. It won't give you high fi information, but very, very handy. Everybody, I know, like for example, the perf is a nice example. Before perf getting the kernel, you know, you have to patch the kernel to get the perf, uh, profiler working. Now you just run the perf, get some data, even though it's simple, but help you a lot. And you do that online, so I give, the, I give this talk at another computer architecture conference where computer architecture people run their programs, a, let's say, a two-second benchmark. You have to run one week to get the result. Okay, so they're working on that uh, scale uh, because the CPU running on gigahertz. So for there, they got very high fi information, know what has happened really on every cycle, but you don't want to take uh, two weeks to wait for a two-second benchmark. Right, that's which is the reason why they always use the nonsense benchmark like spec CPU to get those those finish like in let's say one microsecond, you run two days, you get a result. Right? You won't it's not handy, no one wants it, they hate it, everybody hate it. Right. So in this in this we just try to sell this to the computer architecture people also try. So we try to make a both that you can easily collect some high a, a validity information and same time is handy enough and it's, you can get online. And it will be cool, you can open the, you can turn these tools on forever on your production system. So what's the insight? What, how we can do that? First thing that we defend that all the systems, what they are doing, all the softwares and hardwares, while they're working, they generate some interesting signals. They keep generating some interesting signals. There are hardware, hardware signals. For example, hardware prompt counters tell you that how many instructions per cycle I done in last cycle, or how many, last, how many memory transactions I have done. All these are hardware uh, uh, signals. At the same time, actually, software generates signals too. Softwares mutate the state. So when they mutate the state, for example, this is just A function, call B, call C, and uh, this software actually generates signal looks like this. So if you say this is a X is the time, Y is which method you are in, if you ask this question, and then this software will stay 
in A and call in B from B back to A and go get in C. Right? Those are signals. A software signal, the hardware signals. When you do the performance profiling, the key point is that you figure out the correlation between those signals. You want to know that when my IPC go high, what's my software looks like? Or when my software in method A, what's my IPC looks like? So you grab those signals, you try to figure out the correlation. That's a, after you collect the correlation, then it's your creative process, try to figure out where the problem. Right, and, and, and the machines won't help you when you do the creative part, but here we just try to ma make this tool give you some more information. And uh, uh, here are just examples, some like for example, the hardware and software. Hardware has some counters, it's quite commonly used, everybody used that one, and also tags. Right, the hardware also has tags. And uh, the software has counters, you count, for example, I have a malloc. If you call malloc, actually malloc maintain a counter, tell you that what's your next position is. So those are counters. Uh, also tags. Tags means some information is not counter. Like which method you are in, what's the, how, how deep your, your, your stack, or all those information are tags. Okay, so we, our key insight is that how can you observe this signal in high frequency? Right, we observe the signal from another hardware context. If we look at one CPU, it's keep generating signal, and we just try to observe from another CPU. That's so simple. And uh, here's the design, how we do that, right? For the global counters, for example, I want to measure last level catch miss. You get the last level catch miss per cycle, and you can observe this counter from any core, right? And then your code like this, well true for counters for let's add the rhythm to a buffer, right? And then your sampling frequency is limited by how fast you get in this loop. And that's your limitation, not the whole pass go to interrupt, handle interrupt, or come back. Right, you become this one, you observe that one. But the problem is that the CPU won't allow you to observe inside the core. You, don't, you cannot observe another core's performance counter Right, CPU won't always do that. Uh, here we try to hack that one. Uh, for example, for this Intel CPU, and now it has two hyper threads for each core. Let's say this is application is running, it generates very interesting signals. And we try to observe signal. We cannot observe signal from another core, but actually we can go to HT2. We go to HT2, we go to HT2, and then we set up two counters for each type of events. One counter count for what has happened for the whole core. You can do this with hardware. And another counter count what has happened for myself. And after you take these two counters, you, you manage them, and you get what has happened for the HT1. Right, so this is a hacky way to do that. And I give this talk on Intel again, and, uh, and they said, this is cool, but sorry, you won't able to do this anymore after next year, which is <laughs> after, after this year. And I, I said, why? This is why you don't support this one, sorry. And I said, we are software people, we have low priority on Intel, and the hardware the guy decided that if you expose the bit to measure the whole course behavior, it creates the security problems, other guys can attack your program. And, but I said, you, have shared, you share many information, you, you can attack anyway. And they said, we cannot decide anyway. So it's just close. It won't work for new CPU, right? For this, but you still can observe the global counters, okay? And now is that a, so your HT1's IPC equals, sim, simple. So your, and also your frequencies decide how fast you can do the observation, not decide by how fast you can deliver the interrupt. It's very simple. So, and the most interesting thing is that you grab the HT1's IPC in information itself is not so interesting. What is the most interesting that if at the same time you know which method is in, or which function is calling, or any other software signals, you collect them at the same time on the same timeline. So. And if you compare the HT1 IPC with your software information, and you can get a very interesting correlation story. 
And this, you can analyze them by machines. You don't need by yourself. You can throw the way to some simple statistical analyzed tools and tell you some correlates, how strong they are correlated, right? And now your program a little bit complicated, right? You say, I want to have two, I have to set up counters, two counters, I read them, and I manage them, get the value, and at the same time, I want to know who is running on HT, on the HT1, and you get a method. And so, you read them at once, you patch them together, and you collect as much data as you can get. And after you accumulate enough data, you throw away the data to a model, and this tell you that, uh, hey, your program looks like behavior very weird if you f call A to B, right? And uh, when you call A to B, your IPC always drop, and you can look why from A to B, you get more slower, right? So, and uh, here the problem is that, okay, cool, now we can sampling at high very frequency, but the problem is that when you do anything at high frequency, the noise is becoming much, much stronger than when you do on low frequency. How can you figure out the noise? How can you, how can you throw away the data you cannot trust? And so here is the row samples. If you call the IPC, anybody can see the problem here? Like the X is IPC, Y is the percentage of samples, right? On this machine, the maximum IPC you can retain actually is four instructions per cycle. But if you naively sampling at high frequency, and this will get, this one tell you that the CPU looks like require 10 machines per cycle, right? And when you're, when you're sampling at high frequency. So where, the problem, where, uh, where are those problems coming from? So if you come back, we look again, what we try to calculate a lot of times is a something per something, which is we calculate the read, right? How we do that, we do it again, this is the time, you have two counters, one counter for, for cycles, another for instruction right here. And then you're gonna read them. You're gonna read the, those two counters. The problem is that the, you, you, you cannot read them with one instruction. You have to read them with the two instructions or three instructions or five instructions. And then you get tiny period to do the measurement. And do again, do the same thing, okay? Then the measured period is much, much larger than your measurement period and everything is happy, but now we try to push the measured period as low as possible, and then the measured period actually pretty much same as your uh, measurement period. And so your, your, and then we just try to squish the uh, space between the two uh, red boxes. And we do this again, we do this again, right? For example, if in RC3C, this interrupt is coming and you're gonna handle the interrupt. And then you, your IPC3, that number gonna be look weird, right, if, if in this case. So, and in this case, your IPC1 looks okay, your IPC2 is looks okay, I, your IPC3 is looks like bad. You, looks, you, you know it's bad because, for example, it is 10, or it is 0 0.0000, but the problem is that when the IPC3, the no, machine tell you that, uh, the system tell you that your IPC3 is two, which is a reasonable number. And how can you decide, I trust this sample or can, I cannot trust this sample? And uh, we get a simple solution, which is we use clock as a ground truth to filter out the data. There is a ground truth on your machine that is called cycles per cycle. Cycles per cycle always be one, right? So cycles per cycle should be one. That's the ground truth. Anytime you do any measurement, unless you change the frequency between the measurement. And here's the time. We still do the same thing, but every time we do interesting measurements, we, we, read the we read the time step counters twice. And later we read time step twice again. Right? We, 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 we bring some overhead here, but it's okay because those two instructions and give you 40 cycles. And here again, and now we can calculate IPC, and at the same time we calculate CPC, right? And uh, if the CPC numbers look reasonable, in this case we say we can, give, we can trust you in 1% error margin, and then you say, okay, yeah, I give you, I give you just, uh, and then I accept it. If it is larger than 1%, I won't trust you. So in this case, if your IPC2 is inside this 
range, and IPC3 is not. So we never look whether the IPC, IPC is what we want to measure. We never look whether the IPC makes sense. We just look a payload calculation called CPC. If CPC is wrong, and we don't trust IPC. If CPC is correct, we assume that your IPC won't be that wrong, so we just trust you, right? And now our loop becoming a little more complex and uh, becoming, we read the counters, we read all interesting counters, we read the counters again, right? And then we also read the method ID or blah, 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 blah stuff. And then still the frequency decide by how can you go through this cycle. It's not decided by how fast you can handle the interrupt or how fast you can handle the slow pass. And this is run on another hardware thread. So which means you can, if something wrong, you just keep going there. Okay, and it's, it's working. So this is a filtered, this is a original row IPC. It has numbers larger than 10. And if you, if you calculate the CPC, it's gonna be looks like this. So the CPC one is gonna be, should be the ground truth. So we, we look at the ground truth, we chalk, we, we, we chop others away, and now it looks like this, right? So those green samples are those samples we can trust. Uh, all others, if you can look like the high numbers, it's automatically gone, and, but there's a few, many low numbers, which is what we're interested, why the IPC can go so low, right? And now your IPC won't be higher than four, but the key point is that we never look whether your IPC is a trustable number or not. And uh, uh, of course, because we do the uh, profiling, we do the, a, uh, now is we do a, a profiling in a pooling style. There is a thread, it's capable of pooling, it's gonna be some have overheads. And uh, this is the most simple case where you don't care about, you don't care about anything about the hardware information. You just ask a simple question, say, hey, please tell me how much time I spend in on all those methods. So you can observe method and loop ID, you can figure out that's what. And, you, and to, to, to measure this signal, you don't need to go to the same call, you can observe from another call, right? And uh, there's a, when you do that high frequency you can go, the overhead is quite high because you do a lot of catch invalidation traffic between the two calls. But if you go to 1,000 cycles, but if you go to the 1,000 cycles, and actually the overhead is almost gone. So, which means if you observe a high frequency signal from a remote call, and 1,000 uh, cycles uh, frequency, your overhead is less than 1%. Uh, uh, so which is acceptable, and uh, 1,000 cycles much, much, much higher frequency than 100 kilohertz, which is supported by the perf, right? So 100, and if you do 1,000 cycles, the frequency is like that. So what has happened if you do that on the same core? Your overhead is gonna be near 50. Why is near 50? Because you go to the same core, you occupy another hardware thread and you get half resource. So your overhead is gonna be 50%. It doesn't matter whether you run fast or you run slow, you'll always be 50% near that one. So now I have another paper which tried to nail down this problem, but I don't, uh, maybe next year I talk, talk that about. <laughs> and then how do you have software signal on same call? Same thing here, right? So uh, now it's because when you observe the hardware information, because the limitation from the CPU, we cannot observe from a remote call. So we have to go to the same call because we go to the same call, so we have to allocate half resource. Because we have allocated half resource, our horror had always 50%. So hope some hardware guy is gonna fix this. And now I can, <laughs> but they are just, they just stupid, so. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Google, uh, I'm gonna use some uh, examples to show some interesting I collect in this way. And because you can sampling at high frequency, you get many, many interesting informations you've never seen before, right? A Google Proto Buffer, which is uh, very commonly used, I, how see that? RPC, I think it's RP, uh, remote RPC framework used by Google. So 
And then they have an example on their website, so to do the synchronization uh, to communication between two machines. And uh, uh, the Google is look like spend maybe 4% of total Google machine cycles doing on the proto buffer processing. Uh, those, those, those are some of my papers. So, so if you look this key sample function call, it take about 25 microseconds, which is no, not, not bad or, or good, I don't know. Right? So I just measure that one, it's give, it tell me 25. And say, now if, you use, now if you use normal perf, by lucky you hit one sample inside, because your sampling frequency is 100 kilohertz. Right? And this one take about 25 microseconds. So if you, you can run enough, so you, you're never able you're never able to know what is happening inside. But you, of course, you can go to other tracing framework. But you have to instrument your code, blah, blah, blah. Right? So here is a trade-off that uh, with, the, with the shim, you can sampling at uh, much higher sampling. And this is a, a simple program. Uh, uh, because that, that call is going to be staying in kernel to do some field system work. So it's pretty much most time in and user and kernel. And then now you ask a question, say, please tell me IPC, this is hardware information counter I care. Same time tell me you are in kernel or you are in user. Right? And you do a correlation analyze between IPC and the user kernel, you get this graph. Where the X is the samples, it's timeline, and the Y is IPC and two lines. One show that uh, when this guy is in, in kernel, another show is in user. So from this one, the guy, actually those system call spend about half time in kernel, half time in user. And every time it go to kernel, your IPC drop a lot. Every time you come out from the kernel, you just like reburn, like you just resume your normal IPC. Right? And uh, when I give this talk and the Intel and I give the samples, so, so the problem about the fundamental problem about this one is for the Linux kernel the simple write, the code pass of a simple write is so complicated compared with a normal simple read. So one guy there, and after I give this talk, and one guy threw away, threw, I think he threw about 10 or 20 pages to Linux kernel, try to fix the, uh, uh, try to fix the footprint of write system call. When there is nothing you want to write inside, you just want to write one byte there uh, it takes so many instructions, right? Now the uh, this so with these tools you can get many many interesting things. But I think the most important for this one you can do some micro analyze automatically. For example, what I was collecting an interesting number that system call looks like quite heavy before I invented these tools. Right, and after I invent these tools, a lot of system call looks like more than 200 key cycles or something like that. So I decide, okay, probably I can run some simple programs. And uh, I only try to measure the program behavior when the guy is in the kernel and it looks like. So it's found that your kernel is pretty much flush your level one instruction catch anytime you get in kernel. So pretty much you call a kernel, what that, for any simple system call, not any simple, but most simple system call, when you come back, the level one is flushed. So you come back, keep working. And so here's a one example where I try to collect the information that is called system unlink. The first number say this system unlink take about 40 key instructions to finish one, um, one system unlink. It covers 30 key bytes instructions. So the footprint is 30, 13, 13K bytes, where you touch one key catch length for the system unlink. And here the graph shows a distribution about level one, level, sorry, level two instruction catch me because I don't want to measure level one anymore. Level one is flushed. <laughs> level two instruction catch missed per one um, key cycles caused by these instructions divided to every, I think, every 300 cycles. And so, so, so the Y is superior. So it means that when for this one system call, how many times you have those level, those two catch me's? So you can say that 
it's quite common that you get, you're gonna be, your in, uh, this graph tell you that your kernel trapping system unlink, pretty much no loop. You just stay in unlink, unlink and do a very interesting computation there and there's no code reuse, right? And you come back. So this is interesting numbers. I mean, this audience may be interested. Uh, uh, so for acti a computer architecture people, I just need to tell them that you don't need to wait two days to get your data, and they're just happy. <laughs> so reduce, reducing the overhead. How can we reduce the overhead further? Because the current overhead is still 50%. And if, if you talk with many people, say, I got who to who to, but it's 50% uh, overhead. And they just look at you, hmm? just go away, right? And then one example is the birth sampling where you can still build on top of perf. After you perf tell you that some methods are hot or whatever, and then you go to the birth sampling approach. And uh, then you only spend, you only take about 50% overhead when you does a, when you, oh, sorry, when you do a very short period analyze, right? So now the news number is that uh, I can do around about uh, 20K instruction, 20K cycle sampling with less than 2% uh, on Intel machines. So which is pretty high. Another one is the SMT priority. You can, you, can, you can tell the CPU say, I have a profiler thread. Please make that thread as lowest priority you want. Right, and that's a simple solution. And uh, uh, hardware people won't do that maybe. And uh, high engineers, multi call you have some special course that's profiling work and analyze the code. And uh, global visible performance counters, you can expose the counter to, mod to other calls. You don't need to get in the same call to do analyze. And the conclusion, so we think the high frequency sampling is important, so we do this. And if you don't think it's important, you just, you don't, it's okay with perf. Uh, shame, try to observe signals, not interrupt, grab your signal. We just try to observe anything we can do. Okay, and we use a CPC to filter samples, and we say there are some opportunities for hardware design. You can just turn our cost overhead uh, to very low, and here's uh, just a, a a for the hardware design, and also here's a code uh, it's on the GitHub. So it's because I'm PhD, so I write a pretty bad code there. So it's a very, <laughs> very fast, as fast as prototype that make your paper get in. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just throw it away. No, not throw it away. Something I talk with Andy Kirin, who work for Intel, Perf support a lot. I try to now try to somehow figure out a way how to provide the two together with him, make this work better. Uh, so. Uh, but this, this code is rubbish. This is, this is a faster <laughs> prototype. You can have a look. So, and then the question. Questions, yeah. That's all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Do you, does the profiler distort the profile at all, given that it's taking up a lot? 50% of the resources, do you find that changes what you're measuring? It, of course it's changed. Also, of course, it, that's a very good question. Anytime when you do the measurement, you change the things you measure, right? And it, you go through quantum physics, that's a pretty extreme <laughs> example. Where yeah. You observe the guy, the guy just changed his you know, name or whatever. So uh, for this case, if you observe, because you have to go to, the, especially for this case, you have to go to the same core, you get half resource, and then, of course, the guy's IPC is going to be much lower than if running alone. Mm -hmm. But the point here is that when you do the observation, you stay in a loop, mm -hmm. right? Your behavior is very stable. So I, your behavior is just like that. And then you try to observe what is happening for core. So you can make a reasonable decision that the signals, variations in signals observed from the core is it somehow reflect the behavior of that program. Right, the trends are stable. Yeah, but yeah. you have to figure out how to, you have to f do some uh, correlation between the things to make it work. Yeah. Uh, 
My other question is, is the profiling thread a kernel thread or is this something I it's can... It's a user-level user thread. Oh, I can see counters in user space? Yeah, with uh, Andy Killing's... I think Andy Killing summit patch there. Then you... Okay, there's a trick here. Oh, uh, cool. <laughs> when, you do, when you create a perf counter, at the same time you say, please do a sampling mode, and you can figure out a way, grab the, grab the performance counter index. So because perf gives you an abstraction view, you grab the real index, the RDPMC instruction is executable on the user level. You can read the counters, but you just need to figure out what those counters are. Uh, okay. Right, so you can read the counter. It takes about 20 cycles to read one counter. Okay, cool. Right. Any more questions? Uh, so you said this isn't going to work anymore when they stop letting you see the... This is uh, the, the, the full function. Okay, there's an interesting thing here. So what, I mean, what's the plan? So, <laughs> they, so it won't work if you observe the core private information because they just, they just turn off that bit and they don't probably, those hardware guys won't take care of my research so they won't bring it back. <laughs> So, uh, but the problem that, yeah, but the problem that for Intel, now they have more and more anchor counters, right? So you can still do the same thing for the anchor counters. Like, you can do interesting about DRAM. Now I can do last 500 cycles, which DRAM bank you touched, right? Okay, something like that. Um, but you won't able to observe core. But Intel has a new tool called a Intel Processor Tracing, uh, Intel PT, which gives you exactly control flow of the program when you do the profiling. You can grab those information and try to build some correlation model with Uncore, but you cannot observe the core private. Yeah, I mean, the Uncore doesn't have cycles or anything. The, the, the cycles, no, it does not. But Intel PT, Intel PT give you IPC, those cycle information. The Intel PT give you a full control flow. A control flow means Intel PT tell you that your, your program jump from address A to address B and then blah, blah, and, and also what their IPC looks like. Then I push to the buffer, and the, what you can do is you can do on remote call, and you grab those buffer here, and same time you profile the on-call, and you try to smash them together. This is my next paper, but uh, after I submit that, I, done, I finished my PhD. So. <laughs> okay, but yeah, so you do have some ideas for how to. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And also for on PPC, maybe you can do more interesting things. I just talk with PPC guys, but I don't know that. <laughs> maybe PPC hardware is easy to change or not? Uh, yeah, um, I, <laughs> I, 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 I talk with one ARM designer. He, I have good friends work for ARM. I tell him, this is cool. And he said, yeah, this is cool. But uh, do you think our customers care about this? Uh, because we are an IP designer company. So if TI say this is cool, and we may bring this in. And if you, <laughs> so yeah. Any more questions? Okay, well, we wish you the best of luck in finishing your PhD. Yeah. And on behalf of LCA, I'd like to present you with this gift. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Xi. Thank you very much. Thanks.